here is the section for the Odes of Solomon. Remember, Jerry Mattatix challenged me that uh, there's, there's really nothing uh, that would indicate that there's any influence of Gnosticism on the Odes of Solomon. So I posted this on Facebook yesterday. Ode 19 from the Odes of Solomon. I'm, I, I don't write the folk stuff. I just read it. A cup of milk was offered to me, and I drank it in the sweetness of the Lord's kindness. The son is the cup, and the father is he who was milked. And the Holy Spirit is she who milked him, because his breasts were full, and it was undesirable that his milk should be ineffectually released. The Holy Spirit opened her bosom, that's the Holy Spirit's bosom, and mixed the milk of the two breasts of the Father. Nothing Gnostic about this, no. Then she gave the mixture to the generation without their knowing, and those who have received it are in the perfection of the right hand. The womb of the virgin took it, and she received conception and gave birth. So the virgin became a mother with great mercies, and she labored and bore the son, but without pain, because it did not occur without purpose. And she did not require a midwife, because he caused her to give life. She brought forth like a strong man with desire, and she bore according to the manifestation, and she acquired according to the great power. Nothing Gnostic about this. And she loved with redemption and guarded with kindness and declared with grandeur. Hallelujah. So there you have the ascension of Isaiah and you have the odes of Solomon. And there's only one other. And that is the Protevangelium of James. Now, I read you the Protevangelium of James a few months ago. And I warned you then, and I'll warn you again. This gets a little specific. I mean, not the language, not so much, but the description. But remember, Clement of Alexandria cites this in his Stromata as the source of his teaching. This is where the tradition comes from. When you hear Roman Catholic apologists, well, there's this tradition. Well, where did this tradition come from? Well, it came from the Protevangelium of James, the Ascension of Isaiah, and the Odes of Solomon. And look, the Roman Catholic argument is this. Well, yeah, you know, okay, there's some, there's some odd stuff. It sounds a little weird. I've, I, you know, I've never heard, not once, I, I do not claim to have exhaustively listened to every episode of Catholic Answers Live, but I've never heard these folks actually reading the context of these statements. Oh, they'll make reference to them. But for some strange reason, they don't actually read the whole thing. And there might be a reason. You know, that last one. Well, this one's worse. Okay? All right. So, I've, I've given you a warning, parents. You know, you might want to listen to it first and then... So, <clears throat> in the Protevangelium of James, I'm sort of jumping in. Uh, jo Joseph has run into a midwife. And... And the midwife said to him, Is this true? And Joseph said to her, Come and see. And the midwife went away with him. And they stood in the place of the cave, and behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave. And the midwife said, My soul has been magnified this day because mine eyes have seen strange things because salvation has been brought forth to Israel. And immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave, and a great light shone in the cave so that the eyes could not bear it. And in a little that light gradually decreased until the infant appeared and went and took the breast from his mother Mary. Again, is there, would there be, would I really be wrong to have the enterprise sound in the background here? Because, um, and immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave and a great light shone in the cave so that the eyes could not bear it. And in a little, that light gradually decreased until the infant appeared. So the light goes down and down, then there's the infant. And he went and took the breast from his mother Mary. And the midwife cried out and said, This is a great day to me because I have seen this strange sight. And the midwife went forth out of the cave, and Salome met her. And she said to her, Salome, Salome, I have, 
I have a strange sight to relate to thee. A virgin has brought forth a thing which her nature admits not of. Then says Salome, as the Lord my God liveth, unless I thrust in my finger and search the parts, told you, I will not believe that a virgin is brought forth. And the midwife went in and said to Mary, show thyself, for no small controversy has arisen about thee. And Salome put in her finger and cried out and said, Woe is me for mine iniquity and mine unbelief, because I have tempted the living God. And behold, my hand is dropping off as if burned with fire. And she bent her knees before the Lord, saying, O God of my fathers, remember that I am the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Do not make a show of me to the sons of Israel, but restore me to the poor. For thou knowest, O Lord, that in thy name I have performed my services, and I have received my reward at thy hand. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by her, saying to her, Salome, Salome, the Lord hath heard thee. Put thy hand on the infant and carry it, and thou wilt have safety and joy." And Salome went and carried it, saying, I will worship him, because a great king has been born to Israel. And behold, Salome was immediately cured, and she went forth out of the cave, justified. And behold, a voice saying, Salome, Salome, tell not the strange things which thou hast seen until the, ch the child has come to Jerusalem. So, Protevangelium of James, Odes of Solomon, Ascension of Isaiah. Here's where you have the first references to the beliefs that become foundational. Because if you've studied, if you've studied the Marian dogmas, then you, you recognize that historically there has been this development over time. And... To the semi-unbiased observer, it is painfully obvious that so much of the early development was connected to the rise of an unbiblical, anti-scriptural monasticism. An unbiblical view of marriage, an unbiblical view of sexuality. All you got to do is read the writings of these coming out of Egypt primarily ends up everywhere, but comes out of Egypt primarily initially. These individuals who have absolutely unbiblical views of men and women, absolutely unbiblical views of marriage. It leads to the medieval idea that the religious life, a life of celibacy, is a higher life than a married life. Um, the discipline of the celibate clergy, which of course became a joke during that time period as well. But Mary ends up being elevated to a position of a model, a role model. And this is why what they do is they take from Gnosticism, Docetism, a dualistic worldview, this idea that Jesus' birth was, you know, a beaming into the world. And the reason that the Docetists did that was because Jesus doesn't have a real physical body. So he just beams in. You don't have to have a real physical body when you, you know, th that, that would be something that would be against his nature in Gnosticism. Because the physical is what we're trapped in. The physical is what we want to get out of. Salvation is getting out of this physical body. Um, so you take that and then you bring in this idea of the blessedness of virginity and not being married and not engaging in sexual activity with a husband or a wife and bringing forth children, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and you get this ungodly synthesis that becomes foundational. But, but even at this point, nothing was said by Kelly about the Ananicene period, about the two dogmas that end up becoming the key of the past two centuries in Marian development. Immaculate conception, the idea that Mary is conceived 
without the stain of original sin by preemptive application of the merits of Christ. Oh, early on you get Mary sinless in the sense of not committing sins, even though there were numerous people the first four centuries, oh yeah, sure, Mary committed minor sins, you know, uh, she needed to be redeemed. But then very quickly, no, she didn't commit any sins in her life, but it took forever, forever in the sense of a thousand years, more than a thousand years, British monk named Edmer comes up with the idea that she was actually conceived without original sin. The, the list of, of early church, of, of all, anybody can even be conceived of being called early church. Had no, never taught it, taught against it. Same with the bodily assumption of Mary, never taught it and didn't teach against it because it's like saying, well, you know, I've never found anything in the early church where they taught against um, space aliens from Venus. So it must be true. Uh, well, um, there's just as much discussion of space aliens from Venus in the early church as there is the bodily assumption uh, because it just, no one had even thought about it. The idea of saying that's an apostolic tradition empties the term apostolic tradition of all meaning. Once a Roman Catholic uses the term apostolic tradition for that, what they mean is whatever Rome tells you to believe is apostolic tradition. It has nothing to do with the apostles. It has nothing to do with history. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It's just say, believe what we say. That's it. 